So endogenous toxins are things that we create inside the body by fermentation in the gut, dysbiosis, but we also can generate certain hormones from our way of thinking. So when we change our mind, we then change our expression to the hypothalamus and change our, uh, our releasing thyrotrophic hormones which affect the thyroid, corticotrophic releasing hormones that affect the adrenal cortex, gonadotrophic releasing hormones which affect our gonads, growth hormone releasing hormones which stimulate growth, somatostatin which inhibits growth, prolactin inhibiting hormone which inhibits our prolactin, and a range of 300 or more neuropeptides which can all be affected by our way of thinking. And all those substances have to be metabolized or broken down. Now when we talk about creating a substance, it was from our substrate to our end product, that process is called synthesis. So the making of a chemical or product in the body is called synthesis, or the creation of it. When we break it down, it's called metabolism. Metabolism. See? Previously these were called anabolism and catabolism, but it's now called metabolism is the breaking down and synthesis is the creation. So external toxins, as we said, were called xenobiotics or strange, come from a distinct group of input. So it's what we eat, okay, the things that go through our mouth. It's what we drink. It's what we breathe in the air. It's what we put on our skin or transdermal. It's electromagnetic pollution, in other words, wavelengths that we can't necessarily be aware of. Some of them we are aware of, but some we don't. And harmful solar wavelengths, in particularly in the ultraviolet end. So if you're out in the sun and it's high for too long a period, we know we need 10 minutes front and back midday to develop our vitamin D. But if we then go and get an excess amount, we can get burnt and that creates problems. So in order, when we have a buildup of internal toxins or external toxins, uh, we have to detoxify or, or rid our body. So detoxification is a generic word for the metabolism, previously called catabolism, of both the endogenous and exogenous hormones. We've said the endogenous ones are neurotransmitters, hormones, eicosanoids, these are um, uh, prostaglandins and leukotriene substances. Certain fatty acids have to be broken down, particularly the short chain fatty acids, um, odd ones, and retinoids, which are compounds from vitamin A. Uh, the main exogenous chemicals or xenobiotics are either water soluble, which are relatively easy to eliminate, or lipid soluble, which are fat soluble. And if we can't eliminate those, then we store them in our fat. Okay? So the fat becomes a store for toxins. And apart from superficial um, subcutaneous fat, we have other fat surrounding our organs to protect, so that's another thing. But one of the biggest sources of uh, locations of fat is of course breast tissue. Um, is largely fat and lymph, and the other one, the ultimate, if you like, is the brain, which Jeff Blank calls a fatty tumor on the end of the spinal cord. <laughs> okay, because remember that most of the dry weight of the brain is fat. Okay, or more specifically, very specific fatty acids in particular ratios for particular functions. Okay, so lipid soluble chemicals are generally metabolized by hydroxylation. <laughs> In other words, adding an OH makes them more water soluble. That's why we hydroxylate or add the OH. So it has similar characteristics to water. Lipid soluble chemicals are then conjugated or linked to eliminate through the kidneys or through the liver and the biliary system. Now, the problem is if you take a fat soluble toxin, you hydroxylate it, and you then conjugate it or lock it in with something that passes through the liver, it goes into the bile. And then the bile secretes this into the intestine. And the intestine passes the bile down the small intestine and into the large intestine. And then nine tenths of the bile is reabsorbed. Okay, that's a problem, isn't it? Because that means that those fat soluble toxins start going round and round. So you start reabsorbing your own toxins. So this is when you have to take something to bond the bile. And to bond the bile, you have to have a fiber or solid substance which will bond it. Now, 
previously, or in a lot of cases, people have used clay to do this. Clay is a great detoxifier or bonder. So you can use clay products if the person is tolerable, or insoluble fiber. Now most people used many years ago wheat bran to do this, or wheat, uh, yeah, wheat bran. And then people say, oh, I'm allergic to wheat, etc., etc., or they find that wheat is rather abrasive, and so they look to oats. Now, oat bran is very good, providing it's organic. Because if it's not organic, it's the full whack of the spray goes onto the bran. So you're mad if you have oat bran which is not organic, because you're just increasing your load of pesticides, which are all fat soluble toxins. So they must be, everything must be organic if you're going to take it in that way. And then other less irritating insoluble fibers to come in, like hemp seed is very good, organic hemp seed, uh, pea bran is very good from peas, uh, rice bran providing, again, must be organic because they do, uh, rice gets a lot of sprays on it, and psyllium is very good. So all these are things that you can muscle test, which is the most suitable for a person. But when you're detoxifying, whether you're actively detoxifying or not, you need to be thinking about the detoxification process through the gut. Okay? So to improve the passing out of the bile with the toxins, you need to think fiber, insoluble fiber, so you pass it out more. If you want to improve the weeing out, then you need more water. So you need to be drinking more water and taking more insoluble fiber of a form which isn't irritating to that person. Many hormones go through a process after hydroxylation of methylation. Caffeine is one of these. Caffeine has to be methylated uh, in order to be able to eliminate it out of the system. And methylation means adding a CH3. So CH3 is a methyl group. Okay. So you might want to write that in your little notebook there. CH3 equals methylation. Methylation is a very important process in many functions in the body, and detoxification is one of those. So a whole range of chemicals are detoxified by methylation. So they hydroxylate and then they methylate. Probably 90% of detoxification involves the metabolism of the endogenously produced chemicals. So this is really interesting because it's the same process that detoxifies endogenous toxins as it does exogenous toxins. Okay, So this is very, very important. So that hydroxylation and conjugation or methylation is the same process for internal chemicals as external. So when a person shows toxic to an environmental or xenobiotic, all right, in other words, they're showing sensitive to an outside chemical, they've got a real problem inside. Don't forget that. It's not the outside ones which are the issue. It's the inside ones, because if you can't detoxify an outside chemical, you are in bad shape inside. Okay? In other words, your detoxification ability is full up. So if you're not detoxifying something you put on your skin or a chemical that you take, it means your internal chemical detoxification system is jammed up. Okay? So once a person becomes sensitive, and you notice with people that this, they come in and they say, well, you know, I can't tolerate that cream. Okay? So you say, oh, that's interesting. Um, and uh, you, take, you find them and you do another cream and they're okay for a while. Then they come back and they're intolerant to that one. And then they're intolerant to their toothpaste. Then they're upset by eating this food. And then they're upset by that. And then they end up, I can only eat Tibetan grass. <laughs> no. I can't eat wheat, I can't eat dairy. No eggs, I'm a vegetarian. You know, Everything is they're sensitive to. And you think, well, there's some, another cause to this, isn't there? Somebody who starts developing problems to the outside world has got big problems inside. Do you see what I mean? Okay. So don't start taking them off weeds. If a person starts showing sensitive wheat, they've got a problem. There's no question about it. They've got an internal problem. Okay. They shouldn't do a sensitivity wheat because the rest of the nation, the rest of the world can eat wheat. Okay. Okay. Unless they've got a genetics predisposition with a true celiac, anybody who's wheat intolerant has got a problem. They should be able to tolerate wheat in reasonable amounts. So you look at a different way. You say, right, okay, let's see what the chemical loading is with this person. Let's see what the toxic metal loading is. Let's decrease, let's get their detoxification system up, and then they begin to be able to tolerate it. Now, we discovered this um, two years ago now, 
uh, with the work of Roy Lee from the Standard Process, who founded Standard Process, was a great advocate of making your own bread. And the most important thing in making our bread was to mill your own wheat. Okay? And not just any wheat, but mill organic wheat fresh. Okay? And I thought, well, this is novel. My mum used to do this. You know, I was brought up on wholemeal bread um, that she made, and we hated it. <laughs> you know, bless her. Oh, it was a joy to go to the boy next door's house so we could have a bit of white bread <laughs> as a sandwich. You know, it was lovely, delighted. Now I look back and think, thank heaven she did, because I've all got all my own teeth and hardly any fillings and so on as a result of that. But mum used to make it from flour that she would buy. But now we realise with the works of Royal Lee, flour goes rancid within between one week and four weeks. In the summer it's only one week, unless you keep that flour in the fridge. When you go to a supermarket and you buy flour, is a sell-by date on it, not a manufacturing date. It can be years old. Okay? Now you make wheat, bake bread from old rancid flour, you will react to it. Okay? And I will guarantee you, nobody in this room who puts their hand up and says, I'm sensitive to wheat, will weaken to Jill's bread. Guaranteed. I haven't met any one person yet, you know, because she mills her bread, mills her wheat, makes the bread, and that's how bread used to be. Okay? It's made with all the ingredients, yeast, etc., etc. We haven't had one person weaken to it at all. And the biggest lover of your bread is your dog, isn't it? And the dog is a good discriminant. You know, it doesn't like white bread or you know, things which have rubbish in them. It'll sniff around, but it'll go for Jill's bread. Okay? So proper wheat is different. Most of you will never have experienced it. We did this on the update the year before last, and people were amazed. We used unpasteurized milk, unpasteurized butter, as we call it, and Jill's whole grain bread uh, made from organic flour and organic spelt. And it was beautiful. People said, I've never tasted bread like this. And it's dead easy to make, and you won't find people who are allergic to it. It's not difficult to make your own bread. It's just time consuming. And that's what people have. When you eat that, and then you go into the supermarket, and you buy wholemeal bread, you feel awful with it. Whole grain bread, I'd feel, ugh, you know, I wish I'd never bothered. You know, I'd rather have a slice of white bread, which has no vitamins in it to metabolize it. But on the other hand, I don't feel awful and heavy and tired as a result of it. So those rancid fats within commercially produced bread that you people buy have got to be detoxified. Okay? And this is what makes you feel really heavy and tired after eating it. So remember, 90% of detoxification, maybe even more, is involved with the breaking down of chemicals inside the body. Bad fats, bad chemicals in the gut, breakdown of hormones, etc. etc. We have to break these neurotransmitters. Every neurotransmitter has to be organized. Otherwise, they raise up and up and up and up. You know, acetylcholine is a great thing, but you don't want too much of it. Okay, you've got to get rid of it. However, to fully understand endogenous detoxification, and that was how we break that, where it's easy to start learning about breaking down outside chemicals, but it's the same process. So those from outside may be things of medical relevance. Uh, re relevance. So one of the major things that we have to deal with is medication. Now, it's not our job as healthcare practitioners to take people off medication. And that's very important. We keep people on the medication, but it is useful to be able to test, muscle test, the tolerance of their medication. Is a particular medication tolerant for this person? So what you do is you get them to bring their medicines in, and you test them one by one. If they're in blister packs, you take it out of the blister pack. Do not put a blister pack on because it's aluminium. You know, you might get all sorts of reactions. Take it out of the blister pack and put the dose on that the patient takes. If they take three tablets, put three tablets on. Don't put one because they may be able to tolerate that. So put on the dose that they're taking. Then put those to one side. Now be very careful if all tablets are white that you don't get them muddled up. Okay? So put them down there. Then do the next batch of tablets that they're on and so on. Now, some people are on a lot of tablets, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So it's terrifying. When we go to America, <laughs> we talk to the docs there in Los Angeles, and they say, you know the average number of medications that Americans take is 12. Mm -hmm. 12 medications. I say, no, impossible. You wouldn't have time to take 12. 12 medications. And most of them are for side effects of the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that. That's what they are. So medical tablets are very important. So what you do is you do one tablet, well, one batch, one batch, one batch, all individually, and then you must put them all on together. Okay, but keep them separate, obviously, but you put them all on. 
because you want to see the interaction of these medications. So individually, they may be able to cope, okay? And one of these may increase the detoxification system pathways and one may decrease it. But put the two on together and it can mess it up altogether. And this is when people get drug interactions. They can tolerate one, they can tolerate the other. But give them then, then they react and so they have to have a third medication to get rid of the urtic area of this one and so on. So you put them all on together. So that's the way we handle it. So drugs, chemical carcinogen, carcinogens and pesticides and other compounds. These are chemicals from outside the body. So there's more than 75,000 synthetic, uh, 75, synthetic chemicals. It's probably creeping up towards the 100, I believe, now, thousand synthetic chemicals now exist. Most will require detoxification. And <laughs> the interesting thing with most medication, or well, 50%, they reckon, of medication has never been tested for toxicity because it's been established for so long they've never done the detoxification or toxicity trials. So they don't know how the body gets rid of it. And the problem is you don't know whether you're tolerant to it until you have it, okay? So the patient can be perfectly healthy, they can then have a medication or you're exposed to a particular cream or toiletry, and then you can react, okay? And sometimes you may be able to use that for a year, and then all of a sudden you become intolerant to it. Sometimes something else is added, you know, you started using a deodorant or a foot spray, which you're perfectly tolerant to, but when you have the foot spray and the cream, then the body reacts. So it's a total loading in most of these cases. So most will require detoxification with the liver being the main organ. But remember, detoxification occurs every cell has to detoxify. And occasionally, a xenobiotic may be excreted unchanged. In other words, we pee it or pull it straight out. So it's convenient to consider the metabolism of chemicals in two ways. Phase one, hydroxylation, making it more water soluble. And phase two, which is methylation or other conjugators. Now, phase one is catalyzed by a family of enzymes called monooxidase enzymes, otherwise known as cytochrome P450 enzymes. Okay? Now, I first did a seminar in Bath in about 1991, I think it was. Did you come to that one, sir? Oh, God, you've been coming that long. <laughs> On toxicity. And I really knew nothing about toxicity might have seemed like it at the time that I did, but I knew a bit more than other people. And the reason I knew a little bit more than other people is I'd been to Russia in the old days, in 91, when it was still the old Soviet Union, and it was very toxic. The pollution was unbelievable. And when I came with Joe Schaefer, my friend, we went teaching there in 1991, we came back and we were both pretty ill when we came back. Absolutely tired, exhausted. And I realized we'd accumulate a lot of rubbish, a lot of toxic metals in there, a lot of stinging in the eyes, a lot of radiation, as we discovered afterwards. And, you know, when we got back to London, it was just breathing the fresh air of Heathrow Airport. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it was so nice, you know, just to sit there in front of an airplane. And, oh, it was gorgeous. In comparison, I can tell you, to Nova Sibesk in Siberia. Okay, so I learned from there. I contacted Jeff Bland because he was introducing about detoxification in those early days. And uh, we chatted together and we decided we'd, uh, we'd distribute his products. It was one of the first products we ever did. And you know, I did a lot of um, seminars and things, uh, took them with him, and eventually I taught a few with him in 92. So I learned a lot about detoxification. And one of the things I learned from Harper's Biochemistry, which always has the a chapter on detoxification, and it's the first one I look at when I get a new copy, new edition of Harper's Biochemistry is the detoxification. And I always mention about phase one, I always mention about this family of cytochrome P450s. And uh, I sort of put that in the back of my mind for 20 something years, um, and talked about cytochrome P450s, but never really understood what it was. And I remember right at the beginning when I read Harper's Biochemistry, and that it said cytochrome P450, was related to uh, on gas chromatography that this enzyme would show display um, a color sequence of 450 nanometers. And that didn't mean anything to me at that time. It was long before I did anything work with color. And then years and years later, I thought 450, I know what that is. That's blue. How interesting. This is a blue uh, color. And it's mid-range blue between 400 and 500. It's mid-range blue there. And it's 450 nanometers. 
And then I went back to Harpers Bay and my mother something 21 years ago. And it said, in the presence of carbon monoxide. So cytochrome P450 enzyme displays a blue 450 nanometer uh, uh, color on gas chromatography when it's exposed to carbon monoxide at 450 nanometers. That's interesting because every element in the universe has a spectroscopic emission. When you go out in the road this evening and you, and you switch the street lights on, they'll go red and then they go orange, don't they? And that's sodium in there, that's sodium gas. It has an orange uh, aura to it or color as it emits. And carbon monoxide emits a blue color. And as years went on, I thought, damn it, all I've got to do is make 450 nanometers and I can tell you whether you've got carbon monoxide poisoning. And you'd be amazed, probably half the people in this room have actually got carbon monoxide poisoning. Not because of carbon monoxide outside, but inside. You actually make it in your, in your mitochondria when you've got hypoxia. When you've got low oxygen levels, you get a build up of carbon monoxide due to the breakdown of hemoglobin. So it becomes very interesting because suddenly we think 450, we can now start to use colors to actually diagnose chemicals in the body. So when a person weakens to 450, you know they've got problems with carbon monoxide, and you know they've got a problem with phase one detoxification. So they are very chemically sensitive, these people. So the first pathway is to hydroxylate by this family. And there are various members of this family, you know, there's a, a whole groups of them, for detoxifying different um, poisons in the system. Now phase two is methylation or conjugation. So the overall purpose, as we said, is to make it more water soluble. Uh, phase one converts them um, into uh, uh, more biologically uh, from inactive substances. In very often hydroxylates them and makes them into more active, which can be carcinogenic. So some substances are better not detoxified if you don't finish the job off. I remember in those early days when we were doing tests on people with xenobiotics and uh, so I would say that some people could phase one, but not phase two. Some people couldn't phase one or two, and some people could phase two, but not phase one. And I remember Jeff saying, which one do you find? And I said, we find overwhelmingly that people can phase one, but they can't phase two. And they get a buildup of these reactive intermediates, hydroxylated derivatives, which can turn uh, inactive procarcinogens into carcinogenic substances. And he said, that's exactly what we find with all the blood tests. In other words, people often can induce the cytochrome P450s that they can do the first phase one, but they can't do phase two. So when we look at people, we need to say, you've got a toxin, is it a phase one or is it a phase two? How do we upregulate both sets of enzymes? So phase one is the family, and there's 14 families of cytochrome P450, um, and they're all abbreviated by the root name of CYP. Uh, so then they're followed by a number, a capital letter, and another number. But we won't worry about that at the moment. But the common ones are things like CYP, which is the cytochrome P450, 1A1. This metabolizes polyaromatic hydrocarbons and a lot of estrogens or estrogens. Okay? So these are important ones within the detoxification of hormones, particularly our estrogens, because people get high levels of estrogens and when they get high levels of estrogens, they A, gain weight, and particularly fluid, um, and they get a lot of menopausal problems, and particularly hot flushes. So as they get older and they get postmenopausal, they get low progesterone, and they get high estrogens. Okay? So the worst thing you can do is to go on hormone replacement therapy, because it'll have to increase the load of the estrogens. So this type of person is, if you've got a hormone kit, you don't just put on uh, estradiol, or estrone, you put estrone and estradiol on together. When you put it on there and they go weak, you know they've got a problem with their cytochrome P450 enzymes to detoxify. A 1A2 metabolizes the 16 estrogens, 1B1 metabolizes uh, the four, which are the real bad ones, and all synthetic estrogens. This is your hormone replacement therapy. So hormone replacement therapy goes through a different <coughs> pathway to the other estrogens, the natural estrogens. Okay? And this is really important because what they found is that synthetic estrogen, in other words, hormone replacement, will build up, particularly the 
intermediates in the bloodstream of people and predispose them to cancer and to strokes. Now, the incidence of strokes with people on hormone replacement therapy, females on hormone replacement, is four times greater than cancer. Cancer actually did increase, and that's what it got a bad publicity about. But strokes were the main thing. They went up four times the number of strokes. And that was really much more serious than the, even the cancers there. So now you hardly hear of a woman on HRT. Really. Occasionally you get a woman on HRT, but it's very rare. You know, most doctors have said, no, no, I'm not going to put you on that anymore. And uh, you start finding that they're using herbal remedies, you know, or vitamins, you know, things that they frowned upon 10 years ago. And you find, oh, you want to take some Agnes Gastaris or something. Uh, then we've got a, uh, 2A6 metabolizes nicotine, 2B4 metabolizes phenobarbital. So all these have particular specific drugs and compounds that they metabolize, and you can use these substances in order to test each of the individual pathways. You don't need to do that at this stage, but those of you who are into practices with toxicity will enjoy you know, a more complicated box with the toxins in there where you can do it. But for most of us, we just need to say, yeah, this person's got chemical overload. How do we detoxify them? Now, the hydroxylation process uses vitamin B3, the coenzyme called NADPH. And this is one of the two coenzymes of vitamin B3. And you remember when it's a hydroxylation or oxidoreductase, I said you need iron or copper. In this case, you need iron. So what it does is the xenobiotic, that's the poison, there with the H, in the presence of oxygen, so you need oxygen in order to be able to detoxify, makes the OH, which makes it more soluble, H2O, water, because we're going to pee it out much easier. And what's this? What's this boy here? This is oxygen with a dot on the end. That means it's got an extra electron, okay, a single electron on its outer orbit. That is superoxide or a free radical. What this means, that every time we go through a phase one detoxification, anything like a pesticide, a hormone, etc., that has to go through detoxification of phase one, creates superoxide. That means every molecule, every molecule of a pesticide, every molecule of a cosmetic, of a toiletry, of a, a poison in your system, that is detoxified, produces one molecule of superoxide. That's why people in toxic environments age much quicker. You know, when you go to toxic environments now, like Russia and China and India, People look old, okay? but they're not old. They look old because they're aging faster because of the production of superoxide, which will then basically become reduced to hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals, etc. You know, it's free radical reactions which damage us and age us. So this is why you need to detoxify, but you don't want to detoxify if you can't finish the job off. <laughs> okay? If you can't finish the job off, you're going to get reactive intermediates, which are going to be more pro-carcinogenic and toxic. So. P450s are heme proteins, like hemoglobin. Now, there's a very interesting thing which we'll be coming on to later on in the future, is hemoglobin contains heme. Cytochrome P450 contains heme. Okay? Heme is a magical substance in the body. We have C heme in a load of enzymes, like myeloperoxidase, nitric oxide synthase, thyroid peroxidase. There's a whole range of enzymes in the body which contain heme, and heme is something which is involved in making hemoglobin to help us carry oxygen around. But heme has a particular property, and that is it can absorb light. And that's why this is called cytochrome. Cytochrome means it's affected by light. Right. So it can not only absorb photons from outside and those packages of light from the outside, but it can actually emit it. And we see these cytochromes in the mitochondria all the way along the mitochondria, where we transfer our electrons in the mitochondrial membranes, we've got cytochrome and heme proteins. And when we generate energy in the mitochondria, particularly at complex four, most of the energy that we produce at, so at complex four in the, in the mitochondria is heat. It's to keep us warm, followed by light. So there is a light that is emitted from every cell in our body. Now, what happens if that light is blue? You call the police. <laughs> the blue lights, okay, means you've probably got carbon monoxide being produced in there. That's what the cytochrome P450 is picking up. Because these poisons poison your cytochrome system 
and you start to break down. And as you break down your hemoglobin, the breaking down of hemoglobin to make bilirubin and biliverdin gives off carbon monoxide. So now you think, hell, now I see why poisons are poisons, okay? Because your body actually can't cope in the respiratory chain and you die from suffocation. If you want to do it quickly, try cyanide. <laughs> cyanide works in very quickly. Now there's a particular frequency, a wave band of cyanide, which we know which one it is, but I won't tell you today. Okay, so they are heme proteins. In other words, they're sensitive to light, which is the great thing is that these things absorb light, but as we'll see in future modules, they can also be stimulated by light. Isn't that wonderful? So which is why you need to get out in the light, because if you get out in the light, you actually feel better, don't you? Because you start to stimulate all your cytochrome proteins in the body because you start absorbing light, okay? which is energy. It's the ultimate energy in the universe is light. They're widely distributed along a large amount of species, especially in bacteria. That means they're in our gut. So a lot of our friendly bacteria are helping us enormously to detox that. They're present in the endoplasmic reticulum of the cells in the body and in the brain. They require NADPH rather than NADH, so it's a different coenzyme of B3. Uh, they require adequate levels of phosphatidylcholine, which is the phospholipid in the endoplasmic reticulum to be able to get the enzymes inside and out. So that's lecithin otherwise. They are inducible, which means we can upregulate them. And it's therefore the mechanism of drug interreactions. Okay? So we can upregulate them and we can also downregulate them. So if they're downregulated, you can't detoxify very well. If we upregulate them, they detoxify very quickly, which means we put on all the effort into phase two. So we've got a phase two there. So let's take an example, alcohol. Alcohol can be phase two broken down. Phase two is extremely good with quercetin. Quercetin is a bioflavonoid rich in oranges. So if you want to break alcohol down, what you must do is to have a glass of orange juice, okay, or eat oranges, okay, phase two detoxation. On the other hand, grapefruit juice contains an arringin, which is a bioflavonoid, that inhibits phase one. So if you have a glass of grapefruit juice, you can remain blind drunk for as long as you want. Okay? So if you want to go out and get pissed really quickly, have a glass of grapefruit juice before you go out, because you won't get rid of the alcohol, okay? You'll remain high for much longer, okay? But if you have grapefruit juice in the morning, when you wake up and think, oh, I'm dehydrated, I have a glass of grapefruit juice, you will inhibit your breakdown. Now, you probably heard of grapefruit juice and the evils of that particular cytochrome P450 with certain drugs, don't you? Antidepressants and things, and St. John's Water is the famous one that they always quote. So there's a lot of drugs, beta blockers, for instance, go through the same cytochrome P450, you have grapefruit juice with them, you don't break the drug down. That means the drug remains active for a much longer period, which may be good, but the thing is that you need much less of it. So where you might go out and have two glasses of wine, okay, you probably only need one. So maybe you want to take out your partner and give them a glass of grapefruit juice before you go out. But don't drink grapefruit juice if you want to get rid of alcohol. Have orange juice later on, because that stimulates quercetin, stimulates phase two detoxification. So it's a game of stimulating one against the other. And certain food compounds will do one, and certain food compounds will do the other. What we really want is the ones that do both, isn't it? That's the perfection. And there is one common substance that does both, which I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. Right, so they're inducible, which means we can increase uh, their uh, availability. Um, they can have polymorphisms, which means they can have mutations. So there can be variabilities which are genetic. So we may have inherited from mum or dad or grandpa, et cetera, an inability to deal with one particular drug or compound. Okay? So you can say, well, my mum had that or my dad had that. He couldn't tolerate that at all as well. So they are genetic. We know that blue people don't tolerate alcohol very well. Okay? So that's an inherited polymorphism or mutation. So they can be inherited and they can also be acquired. So if you've got toxins which block these things from working, or you've had certain viruses or exposure to radiation, you may change the uh, genetic expression of these drugs. 50% of all drugs prescribed by humans are metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes. Okay? 
that probably means that we pee the other ones out or you die from them. Yeah. However, many cytochrome P450 are inhibited by various drugs and their metabolic products. So what happens if you take a drug and it inhibits the ability to detoxify it? You get a great reaction, don't you? And so this is why people can be disastrous. And you don't know that it's disastrous until you've had the drug because they've done no checks on it. They've done no checks on the drug and they've done no checks on you to see whether you can tolerate it. But you guys can do this. You know, you can actually predict before, when you look at your charts here and the charts on detoxation, and if you get the toxin box, you can predict a person would react to a particular drug. And I'd like to know that before I went in and had started taking drugs, which drugs I can't tolerate. Now, if I'm low on a particular family of cytochrome P450s genetically, I shouldn't go near those particular drugs. Things like warfarin, phenobarbitones, and so on, you know, uh, can be deadly for one person and lifesavers for others. So inability to detoxify phase one leads to either the absorption or displacement into the cell membrane, inactivation of specific enzymes, in other words, inhibition, or the toxin binding to serum albumin, which leads to an antigenic um, uh, production of antibodies. So if you are, can't detoxify, you've got two things. Either it causes a gross irritation to the system, or you store it. And if you store it, you, where do you store it? You store it in the fat because these are lipid soluble toxins. So you're fine. So you're walking around with uranium, uh, like, it, like, a, uh, like a bomber really, terrorist bomber in there. You've got all these poisons in you, but you're fine. Okay? And then someone says, if you want to go on a diet, cut out fat for a bit. <laughs> so you cut out fat and you start mobilizing the fat. And what happens then? Boom, they all start coming out, don't they? And this is what happens when people go on strict diets. They go on strict diets and say, I've never felt so bad. You know, I had to, you know, I gave up this, I gave up that, and oh, I nearly killed me. And back in, some of you remember in 1976, the drought year. You won't remember that drought year. Okay, when Britain had a drought, or Europe had a drought. We had strange things happen because a lot of birds died. And the herons were the main ones that were affected. And they really tried to analyze what it was with these birds, of why they died during the drought period. And you know what it was? DDT poisoning. Okay? They didn't die from starvation. They didn't die from dehydration. What had happened <laughs> is uh, there were low levels of food and water. They started mobilizing their fat. And when they mobilized their fat, they mobilized DDT, and it killed them. Because they stored it, and they stored it, and they stored it. And all of us store DDT. DDT was, was banned in this country some uh, 30 or 40 years ago. But then there were so many, I think it was 100,000 tons or something of this stuff produced, wonderful insecticide produced in the world. So out of the 100,000 tons, how much is still around? 100,000 tons, because it doesn't degrade. And it's been banned for 30, 40 years. So where is it? Is Saddam Hussein <laughs> was hiding it? <laughs> no, it's in you, and you, and you, and you, and all of us. Where? In our fat. Okay? And for the girls, where's the main fat? The breasts. And this is why they thought, we know the cause now of breast cancer. They've analyzed breast cancers, and they found increased levels of DDT. But now they know it's just because it's stored there. And with the breast, as it begins to atrophy during the cachexic stages of, of cancer, it just concentrates the amount in it. So it was an aberration with the statistics. Yes, there was DDT in there, but they don't know that it's anything to do with the problem. As long as it's stable, it's all right. And, but it's probably not the cause of the breast cancer, but the body stores it there like it stores it in the brain. But it can be toxic when you start to shift it out in any large amount. So an inability to detoxify means that you store it, but as long as you store it and don't mobilize it, you'll be all right but it may set up allergic type of reactions. Now, nutrients that stimulate cytochrome P450, we looked at, we need obviously iron and we need B3. Uh, you know, we need phosphatidylcholine or lecithin. So we've got B3, uh, and to activate the B3, we need magnesium, iron. We need B2 to recycle B3, because they're all uh, oxidoreductase enzymes. We need alpha lipoic acid for the sulfur. Do you remember I said that's one of the best detoxifiers? Now, Things that will do this. Broccoli. Bad news, isn't it? Broccoli is good for you, okay? But broccoli, unfortunately, is not good for reds. 
So because it, in, it has cyanides in it, which inhibit thyroid function. So people who are red are wise not to have too much broccoli, probably a little bit as well. Brussels sprouts. Okay. European rules are now that we're supposed to call them sprouts and not Brussels sprouts. <laughs> it's actually Brussels sprouts, is it? And not or Brussels. It's, it's not to do with Brussels, but it confuses them in the EU. Okay, St. John's wort, okay, will stimulate phase one, but not phase two, okay. Licorice and black walnut tincture, very good detoxifier, wonderful at getting phase one. Uh, high protein diet stimulates it, low carbohydrate, ethanol, good reason for drinking. Drink alcohol, it stimulates phase one. Again, provided you can phase two. So you can induce cytochrome P450 with ethanol, zinc, copper, chromium, calcium, molybdenum, selenium, vitamin A, vitamin C, bioflavonoids, uh, particularly quercetin, beta carotin, and N-acetylcysteine, which we'll talk about a little later. So we do a product called Nutrient Phase 1 and 2, which is a combination of all these for stimulating Phase 1 and stimulating Phase 2. So this is a wonderful product if your patient is toxic or lives in a toxic environment. We tend mostly to sell this. There's one profession that buys this more than any other, and that's dentists. Dentists buy this product more than any because they're constantly dealing with chemicals and inhaling metals and things. So they need to be able to deal with this. So nutrient phase one and two. If you travel to India, China, Russia, a toxic environment, uh, nutrient phase one and two is the best multiple you can take. Okay, because it stimulates all these pathways to help you. So supplement accordingly. Right, so there's a little chart um, which tells you the different cytokines, and they've even color-coded them for you into the red, green, and blue, because we found pretty much red people, blue people, and green people, which is a genetic expression of the person, have genetic defects or polymorphism in the different cytokine P450s. So you'll find that you can predict a red person will not be able to tolerate certain things, whereas a blue person can, etc. So it's quite a useful little chart, that one.